Welcome to Spiritual Studies Session 41. This session focuses on the triumph and tragedy of early Christianity. What do I mean by this? I mean, <clears throat> the strong potential of women's rights, of an equalness amongst men and women in the early forge, uh, in the early formations of Christianity, and how it went, went wrong. And in tandem with this conversation is a rough history of the beginnings of the Inquisition, um, not just against women, but against pagans as well also gives the ideas behind and decorates the institutionalization that would ultimately come from Christianity. Um, so when considering the history of Christianity and how it was formed, what made it possible, people likely think of many male figures, you know, uh, especially when it comes to the thinking. So maybe Kierkegaard, maybe St. Thomas Aquinas. Um, and this kind of proves the point that I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make. Throughout this history, there has been a fair amount of notable women, um, highly respectable roles, and that this part of the conversation should not be culturally or historically uh, neglected. Far be it from me to talk on the endless ramifications of Christianity's institutionalization, its complete takeover, uh, well, I shouldn't say complete, but very notable, remarkable takeover of cultural dimensions that we have become completely alienated from, for instance, women being um, doctors and midwifery uh, ceremonies uh, that are rooted in astronomical and historical ways, uh, instead of just leading to this commodification of, of holidays. I'm getting away from myself. Getting back into this time period, just after year zero, the beginning of the common era as christianity is pr proliferating we notice that it is a very strange uh, set of beliefs in comparison to those before it for instance this belief in a finite universe a finite creation um, is is contestable the more commonplace um, in many beliefs is that it's infinite and stretching, boundless, and the same when it comes to time. So this belief that time has a beginning and an eschaton, a distinct end, um, is, is <laughs> crazy <laughs> in comparison to much of what was around before. Um, that to say that the universe is not eternal, to say that that manifestation, that existence, matter is not eternal, is, 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 it's odd. It's just odd in comparison. And so with these kind of idiosyncrasies, you know, these strange relationships with astrology and, you know, not, not lacking resemblance to, to Jews of which they already, you know, become familiar, uh, these early Christians would have definitely represented a threat to the status quo, um, which is interesting, it just in contrast, uh, you know, with how it is now, uh, that these early Christians were radicals. And the kind of poster child of this time is St. Justin Martyr. And this is roughly uh, 105 to 165 AD being his lifespan. And uh, this, this guy started schooling in many respects. I mean, uh, Stoicism leading to Pythagoreanism, 
leading to Platonism. I mean, this, this part of the world was a hotbed of, of intellectual fervor. But as he was a young philosophy teacher, he uh, was serendipitously at a beach of which he met a man, un unnamed as far as I can tell, who uh, gave him a revelatory experience and completely shifted uh, as if, you know, enlightenment. And he, from that point forward, would act as one of the most fervent um, supporters of the new, newly forming Christianity, this new age religion. And made these moves to start a philosophy, a philosophy school, a Christian philosophy school. He would take his time to debate um, intellectual thinkers, and he was really good at it. I mean, he, he, was, he would shoot people down. So what used to be just whispers with guys like Martyr, uh, it became loud. It became engaged. And in this... He eventually battles this, uh, well, I shouldn't say battle, debates this guy named Krensis. And Krensis did not like being beaten. So he denounced him to the authorities. Uh, the, the charge is practicing an unauthorized religion. And when, you know, put to the test, he refused to renounce. So he, along with six of his students were beheaded. And this is where we get the term martyr. Now, why is this interesting? Well, for one, historically, this is interesting. And etymologically, this is interesting. But one of these students was a nameless woman. So why? Well, this is the curiosity of early Christianity. The schools were teaching women. Women were being treated as uh, worthy of being taught as opposed to much of the ancient world. So these ancient schools, these philosophical schools had a history of denying women entry. And there's this story in the fourth century BC of this woman named Axiathea of Philicia. Uh, um, she lived in Arcadia. And during the time where Plato is publishing the Republic, she travels all the way over to Athens and dresses up as a man to get into these classes. And this isn't a unique story. Women would have to go through extravagant means to get schooling to become educated. So this contrast of early Christianity providing this schooling is what we can attach to countercultural phenomena. The the whatever is popular and whoever is oppressed by the mainstream, by the popularity, by what is expected of society, they will all kind of end up falling in the same bag in the counterculture. There's many good modern examples of this as well. Um, but I just wanted to set the foreground there. And 400 years after this, when we're talking about this common era, the beginning of this common era, who were the ones that actually witnessed the alleged crucifixion and resurrection of Christ? Well, it was a group of women. And his disciples were conspicuously not present, with exception to John near the end, as it's told. And so women were present at the crucifixion, the, bur the, bur the burial, I've always had a hard time with that, burial, and his resurrection. And so who would have told this tale other than them? 
that when reading the scripture of Luke and Acts, where did they get this testimony? Not from their own eyes. They got it from the women. <laughs> and Mary Magdalene during this early time was the apostle of apostles, a very undermentioned name in modern Christianity. And a number of others, a number of other notable women during this part in Christianity's hi history, Appia, Nympha, Priscilla, Chloe, Lydia, and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I don't want to spend my time doing that. And by the second century, 200 years after this, you see women are going on missionary trips. They are not going as wives. They are going as independent colleagues. There's a place for them here. I hope you're seeing this. And likewise, when it comes to these significant women, there is this apostle, Junia, who only in later uh, Christian history, her name gets changed to Junius. And get used to this because what was there at the beginning has been altered or completely unmentioned. And to mention the unmentioned, <laughs> we have this character of Macrina the Younger. She gave a deathbed oration that was recorded by her brother, Bishop Gregory of Nicaea, or Nas Nissa. Macrina was taught at home. See, here was the other extravagant means of being educated in the ancient world to have affluent parents, to have educated parents, or a, a, a tutor. Because you're not going to go to those schools, right? Unless you're going to dress up, huh? Macrina's paternal grandmother was this notable character of Macrina the Older. And she uh, was a pupil of Gregory Thamatergos, which is another notable name in, Christ, in early Christian history. And they were in hiding, this family, before Constantine, before Constantine came to rule, because this is the oppressive times. And Macrina is being taught by her mother, Emilia. So everything that she knows is quite notable. She was affluent in, in various Greek philosophies and affluent in all things that, were, that was the upcoming religion, spirituality of Christianity. And in this proclamation of hers, she has this highly invested interest in the soul. And of course, it's fitting that she's speaking on her deathbed of it, that there is a oneness and indivisibility of the soul. And this is indestructible. The quote is, the uncomposite will not perish when the composite perishes. And so it's hashing out these, these ideas that are yet to be flushed out in the formation of what Christianity actually believes, because there's a lot of experimentation on that front, especially during this time. And these early Gnostics are a part of this conversation too. And it seems as though some of her inspiration or uh, serendipitous alignment has to do with the Gnostics, and that is in respect to the relationship between the body and the soul. And of course, as we know throughout this course, the Gnostics treat the body and material existence as inherently evil, and that the soul is the one thing to cherish. And so it's affirming these intricacies of that discussion. Macrina the Younger is. And in pitching this, there is no single concept of an engendered soul. And we'll see that this becomes a conversation, that your soul is dependent on your gender somehow. So her beliefs would ultimately be 
taken in some, on, on some fronts, but swept under the rug completely. I mean, have you ever heard this name? Is this, is this a notable part of what is the classical understanding of Christian history? <laughs> no. So of course it wasn't because this was uh, in this radicalization that was forming but not complete. Uh, she would have been demonized or, you know, uh, swept under purely by the act of her gender. That this conversation of the woman's soul is is uh, open ended. So let's let's uh, let's dive a little bit further into what she's talking about. You know, things like anger or desire, the heat of the body that can come over you. The soul cannot contain these things. It's likened to something much more of a bliss state, a pacifistic. It's only what is within God's image. So these more aggressive tendencies are purely of the body. So you can see the hint of Gnosticism in here. When your body perishes, your soul utilizes another body. It's a spiritual body, which is more akin to it. That you move from the incorporeal to, uh, well, reverse actually, from the corporeal body into the incorporeal body, but the soul is never without a host, never without a vessel. And this mutuality of the soul, that all are made in the image and likeness of God, the creator. This was not just her. Her brothers and their constituents also proposed this in these early days. This was a part of the conversation. And this also is a good blend when it comes to the philosophies of Aristotle, of Plato, of all of the uh, philosophies that come before. But to give the counter argument and perhaps the not so inspired side of the many ideas forming during this time, the Antiochenes that uh, inhabit an area in Turkey we're talking about the fourth century as well. They are not so progressive. I've given this argument before in the course, but essentially it goes like this. If Adam was made in God's image and the story as it's been told or as it's been made <laughs> is that woman Eve was forged from Adam's rib. That means that women are not in the image of God. They are in an image of an image. They are in the image of man. So they are a further delineation from God's essence. This immediately giving the grounds for all manner of mistreatment. We may have shared a mutual history uh, but we do not share a mutual humanity. This is the this is the uh, the idea here. This is a direct attack on a certain form of dignity. This is uh, conflating all aspects of patriarchy, which, if you've been paying attention to this course. This has been a slow building trend all the way from the Neolithic, the pre-societal times, from goddess worship to paganism to abstraction, all the way to full domineering male dominance. These ideas would not only perpetuate, but make the act of subduing uh, women and putting them in subordinate positions uh, completely feasible. Now, why do this? Now, this is a big, a big discussion. Why? But we have a hint as to these earlier stories of Genesis, these earlier stories of the creation of man. And the woman is Lilith. 
for those that aren't familiar, she considered herself an equal to Adam and refused to lay under him in the act of lovemaking because this is a symbol for dominance. Lay down and take it. <laughs> God. And she won't. She has a standard. She has a boundary. She has something that she wants to honor. Not just put me where you need me. And so in her refusal, she's banished. And she says, from this point, no matter what I do, you will consider me evil. <laughs> this is tragic. I hope you see this. And what does she become? She becomes an embodiment of lust, you know, like a nympho. And she becomes blamed for all manner of infant mortality throughout history. I mean, monks in the Middle Ages would sleep with crosses over their crotches in order to prevent Lilith from infecting them, inflicting them with wet dreams during their sleep. Ooh, <laughs> this is real. I'm not making any of this up. So what is this? Uh, what's the hint underneath here? So Lilith, to represent this uh, darker aspect of female sexuality. Now, this inadequacy that men can feel, right? Like, um, you know, to feel sexually inadequate, to feel uh, like, uh, I don't know, I don't know. It's just this lack of union, this lack of, of um, like they they can't they can't provide that or they they won't or there's anger. I mean, love is a messy 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 thing at times. I mean, love turns to hate and anger and you know if it's not maintained and you know if it's sustained and all these things. But I just imagine these kind of incel nature, you know, this involuntary celibate nature where or this like craved sexual. Uh, mentality that that's rather you know it wants to dominate it wants it wants to control that they are that they're almost tools right I mean this is this is what we've been battling out of ourselves for I mean but uh, the last hundred years and there's still a lot there's still a lot to to go on that front I mean especially subliminally subconsciously but um I imagine that the story of Lilith and, and this this uh, demoting of women, this this idea to subdue them and to to make them do what we want, is is very is very rooted in 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 wrong places, and it's it's definitely not conducive to a genuine uh, mutual connection of of like authenticity. Uh, it's more just this idea of, oh, gosh, I. I don't know if I can really get to it much further than that, but the creation of Eve in this way is the opposite of Lilith because it's, it's this depiction of the other side of women or what they wanted women to be, which is this kind of uh, subordinate uh, and naive woman. So I feel like these two contrasting stories are really telling. I mean, in, in the psychology of these early church fathers, and mind you, again, they're not the only ones. There are people speaking to something very, very different than this. But, but these people are the ones that will win. They're the ones that will ultimately take the cake. Uh, I mean, look at the apocryphal testament of Reuben, um, verse 1, 2, and 5. Women are evil, my children, because they have no power or strength to stand against up against man. They use their wiles to ensnare them by their charms. And man, whom women cannot subdue by strength, she subdues by guile. I mean, it's painting this picture of their this this venomous, like we have to keep them in control, or they they'll uh, you know they'll ruin us. You know, like it's so toxic. It's it's, it's painful. So you know, and and in, in as I've discussed before, especially if you've listened to the witch talk and the Inquisition, this this uh, institutionalization of Christianity would have never happened if it wasn't for this obsession, this obsession with power, 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 power. And so in this rising authority 
who of these two do you think is more interested in power? Obviously, it's going to be these radicals, these, these patriarchal, misogynistic folk. It's not going to be the ones that are saying that we are all in the image. You know, if you look at the Cathars, for instance, I mean, they never would set to dominate anyone and they had equality. They had, oh gosh, okay, I'm getting off it again. Okay, so this group of radicals and this mentality of this, this innate, written, canonized misogyny, theolide, the, theological, uh, theologically foundational misogyny is is what would later justify the removal of of women's role of of their mark during this time of history and also the removal of or 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 changing of names and changing of the stories so let's hop off that a bit and get into the wider scope so this discussion of astrology in the ancient world is actually very pertinent which not necessarily in practice, but theoretically, if you look at the Zodiac, there are six masculine and there are six feminine. And so theoretically, and this variates from culture to culture, but there is a, a, an obvious balance. There's an obvious balance to these things, that these things need to be balanced, that there's no uh, incongruent uh, engendering of souls. And if you look at any, 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 anywhere in the ancient world, give or take, you see this predominance of astrology in tandem with spirituality or religion and how it inspires mathematics, spirituality, philosophy, and all manner of human affairs down to agriculture. And this you can never talk enough about because it, it's, it's, so, it's so true when it comes to how we formed as a human civilization society what have you oh now now what's pertinent here is the greeks pick this up this this ancient practice as they're making it their own and they attach deities to these different points of the zodiacal wheel and meanwhile we see that we have the library of alexandria which has its own story in the fourth century here, we see Hypatia of Alexandria, and we're going to focus on her here. So Hypatia um, is the daughter of a guy named Theon of Alexandria, and he's a mathematician, a philosopher, and a firm practitioner of astrology. And this is where I stand out on my, on my leg. This is my opinion. Uh, this is not academically sound per se, but there is no record of the mother, and I would be one to believe that Theon was practicing with many concubines or with many lovers a calculated birth. And this is not crazy. I mean, to modern days, it might seem pretty crazy. But in ancient times, Alexander was born of this type of situation, born at a very specific time. And how dare you say that it's weird if you ever looked into Zoroaster, Horus, or Jesus, or a long list of prophets born under very specific stars. But anyway, she was said, Hypatia that is, to have possessed beauty that would have made Cleopatra jealous. And here we have a woman that's risen to predominance in this Neoplatonic school. And she creates an astrolabe like the Antikythera mechanism. She is doing all of this as an intentionally celibate woman. So here you have a leading intellectual woman in the ancient history of Alexandria. This is a very liberal city. You're seeing an amalgamation, a collection of all these different voices throughout, throughout uh, this era. Uh, I mean, you have the Jews, you have the early Christians, you have all manner of pagans, um, Egyptian, Greek, Roman, uh, Persian, on and on and on and on. 
so this is the setting of fourth century uh, of the fourth century of the common era. And this new age religion, Christianity, is trying to find ways to distinguish itself because why would you make a leap from Judaism to Christianity unless there are a number of distinctions between the two? Now, one of these points of contention here that will boil up into violence is that the first commandment reads, you shall have no gods other than me or before me. And this is where the confliction of astrology comes in, right? Because this seems like uh, worshiping idols to pay attention to the stars, you know, Venus, Aphrodite, Mars, right? So that's kind of an awkward situation. Now, as I've discussed before in this course, and I'm not going to repeat everything that I've said, but just to set the ground, there are quotes in the Bible that seem to make it okay. For instance, Judges 520, the stars in their courses fought against the Sarah, very passive mention, in no way makes them seem demonic or any, you know, any, any trouble there. And then you have in Genesis 114, and God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. Casual. I mean, what's wrong here, right? But then you look elsewhere and you see Leviticus and classic Leviticus and Deuteronomy here. Uh, uh, Neither shall ye use enchantments nor observe times. Okay, so uh, how am I supposed to know the signs if I shan't observe times? <laughs> there shall be none among you who useth divination or an observer of times for all these things are an abomination unto the lord deuteronomy 18 10 through 12 so right away we're finding this this kind of neurosis within early christianity that would later be canonized and this this stands for the debate of early christianity at the time because you have those that were willing to assimilate this ancient uh, growth of knowledge through time. And then you have those who are radical that want to do away with it all for reasons of distinguishing and for reasons of power play. And these inconsistencies you see in the literal document of the Bible amongst them, amongst the writers themselves. Oh, so, you know, with these radical uh, Christians during this time in Alexandria, they're not shy to conflict because you already are seeing disputes between the pagans and the Jews. There was a time of affluence here where these, these different parties can contribute to each other. And that's the true beauty of the ancient world. And hopefully to the modern is that people of very different ideas can come together and, and benefit from each other. But no, but, 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 but no, it goes so, so wrong. Because, I mean, there were years and years of being martyred and underrepresented here. And you would think that this would affirm a patience and a peace-driven ethic because you do have such commandments as um, ye shall not murder. But of course, we're going to see that this is quickly... Uh, <laughs> Not, not, not necessarily entertained. And this isn't the beginning or the end of Christian contradictions. But anyhow, you know, you see this woman, Hypatia of Alexandria, who, who is this beneficent, um, beautiful, uh, spiritually celibate uh, public speaker. And you have these radical Christians that are, that are indoctrinating themselves to be very spiteful and hateful to women. So here she is standing up there and by their eyes, um, you know, touting all of this worship of icons, of, of idols, um, and, and not just this, not just these sacrilegious claims and, and these false deities, but that she is a woman doing this. And that is unforgivable. <laughs> oh, oh, gosh. So here's the vicious, um, unforgiving story here. She's riding home in her chariot. And she's stopped by them, this guy named Peter the Lector. And she's dragged into a church and ripped to pieces by either floor tiles or pot shards, depending on your reference. And depending on other reference, she may have been raped 
uh, again, as a religiously celibate woman before she was dismembered. And this would have been defiling, of course, the seventh commandment of ye shall not commit adultery. But hey, don't mind me. And the guy who killed her in the end uh, is named Cyril. And he is named by the, by the leader of Alexandria, uh, by the Christian leader, as the new Theophilos, which means friend of God. And that this title was given because he had destroyed the last remains of idolatry in the city. So you're seeing this beginning uh, or this codification of this blood-soaked era that, that would lead to the Christianization across Europe, across the Mediterranean, and would uh, eventually amalgamate into the Inquisition. And so the problem with women started all the way back here, and the problem with pagans started all the way back here. And the, again, the question is why? And you might think that I'd give this very sophisticated answer, but I have to, I have to say over and over again, it's nothing more than in the interest of power and dominance. And it's a tragedy because of what was lost here. Now, this is also scholarly contentious because they say they don't know how the Library of Alexandria was burned to the ground. Now, this library contained as many as 700,000 scrolls pertaining to mathematics, poetry, philosophy, uh, the natural sciences, and most notably, a long history of astrology. Hmm. And so while the demise of the library is with such uncertainty, who would ultimately benefit most from its complete destruction? I don't even need to answer that now, do I? Because the predominance of these other groups, this is the cradle of the world. This is the, the like, imagine if all of our scientific findings and our progress, per se, I mean, uh, there's, there's some um, tricky assumptions here, but just to imagine that all of this gets swiped, right? All this progress gets destroyed setting oh gosh i'm gonna hop off of it now during this time during right before the burning of the library the emperor theodosius or theodosius outlawed pagan practices this is in 391 a.d so you're seeing this uh pushing over the hill that's happening and then right after this, coincidentally, all of this stuff that is associated with the pagan knowledge of the past goes up in flames. And this interest in this characteristic that goes throughout Christianity's history of monopolizing knowledge, of controlling knowledge, of controlling what people do and don't know, of controlling what you have to say about the past. I mean, only within the last 100 years, people thought that the Bible was the oldest knowledge and book in the world. And, and then comes the Epic of Gilgamesh and all the Sumerian stuff to only realize that Genesis and all these other things were in fact inspired by many cultures before them. So this monopolizing of knowledge still lives in the 40 mile plus library that's underneath Vatican City. Can you get in? No. You can't get in. <laughs> it's very controlled. It's monopolizing knowledge. And this burning of the library, this Christianization through time, this blood-soaked era would sever the discussion of astrology from public and common culture for, for millennia, millennia. And so what, what's this summative statement here? that the Christians in the earliest times, you could say that there were true Christians. And these, this included women as markers, you know, Mary Magdalene, a, 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 an extra a, a edification or, or a sacredness of the Virgin Mary um, in tandem with Christ. And 
this um, this was all there in what what people consider now as still people still talk about the contrast of what Christianity actually preaches within the doctrine and what they do. This is still the problem and has always been the problem within Christianity because there are two different entities at play here. And it's illustrated by early Christianity, the ones that aren't interested in power plays, in, in ruling, in misogyny, in patriarchy. They're actually interested in what philosophical metaphysics or relationship can be um, fostered with this concept of God versus the oppressor. Now, that's the thing. You go from the oppressed to the oppressor. You go from being martyred to making martyrs and not just making them, but going even harder than what was done unto you. Um, gosh, people. So you see this, this, this tapestry of women gaining cultural credibility within the countercultural confines of Christianity during this time. And it had tremendous promise in that women supported, bolstered, provided for the very proliferation, for the very making of Christianity being a thing. And then what happens? It gets twisted, manipulated, and turned on them to segregate and belittle, belittle them for, for millennia. And so from Justin Martyr to Macrina the Younger, we're seeing this underdog system that still lives to this day. And so in all the course and all of my bad talk on Christianity and all these things, I, don't, I am not against this Christianity. I am not against that. I'm, this institutionalization has given me more than enough fodder to speak on, and it still lives. It's not in its heyday, that's for sure. I mean, we wouldn't be talking about any of this if it was in its heyday still. And so here's the discussion. You know, I, it was requested within the course to talk about this, this early uh, destruction of pagans and this early dis destruction of, of women's roles in society. And so here it is. Um, so, you know, what, what, what moral compass can we take from this? You know, it, that, that power corrupts, obviously, it, it, absolutely. That, that um, we ought not confuse religious ideals and values and, and spirituality with these, these power-hungry, ego-ridden um, initiatives of the past. Uh, that these two things are not one and the same. Uh, this power-hungry, ego-driven nature attaches itself to spirituality because it's interested in power. And, and especially in this point in history, religion and governance were very much in the same bed. So if you wanted to take over and you wanted power, you needed to use religion as your, your vestige, as your vessel for doing so. Okay. Okay. Uh, without me belaboring the point, that gives you this this look into into this early point of Christianity, and I hope uh, I hope it helps you put some threads together when it comes to this story of the history of religion and how Christianity moved later into the Inquisition.